Yeah, I'm going to be talking today about supply chain security, um, specifically JavaScript supply chain security. Um, this conference actually has like the OpenSSF at it and a bunch of other tracks that I'm sure if you've gone to, you've heard about uh, this topic quite a lot. And in the last year or two, you've probably heard about this topic quite a lot. Um, and yeah, if you want to, I think that link works. You can follow along the slides or go get them yourself. Um, there's lots of links, lots of content in here. Uh, feel free to follow along. And yeah, so a little bit about me. I see a lot of familiar faces, um, but I'm sure there's some folks that don't know who I am. My name is Darcy Clark. Uh, I've been an engineer or in software development for over 20 years. I was the former uh, staff engineering manager for the NPM CLI for the last three and a half, almost four years. Uh, left uh, GitHub in December. Um, also built a company called Themify. It was like a WordPress, commercial WordPress theme company. Did lots of consulting with all those big brands that you see there. Um, if you want to follow me on Twitter, if you're still on Twitter or not, <laughs> I'm at Darcy on Twitter. So, cool. Um, most notably, I said uh, I worked on NPM, the NPM CLI team for three and a half years. So it was part of the acquisition in 2020 by GitHub. Um, so a lot of my experience comes from obviously managing a team that supported um, a portfolio of over 100 or almost 100 uh, packages uh, with billions of installs monthly. Um, likely, who's run NPM install in the last month? Awesome, cool. So I'm hiding your dev dependencies somewhere, uh, I'm sure. Uh, I didn't write a ton of code. Obviously, I was doing more management, um, but a bunch of the folks that I used to manage are in the front rows here, so blame them for any problems you have with NPM. <laughs> um, specifically, Luke, uh, who still is on the team right now, if you need. Exactly. <laughs> Um, and yes, please go to Luke's talk tomorrow. He's going to talk all about how we orchestrate uh, releases and, and, and everything with those hundreds of projects. Um, but yeah, so significant impact, uh, roughly 2% of that portfolio, or 2% of all uh, traffic that we saw on the registry was for that portfolio of projects. And if you can imagine, uh, and some of these maintainers, this might not surprise you that I see in this, this audience, um, the small team of about four or five, uh, you know, supported, you know, 2% of the entire registry traffic. So when you're talking about supply chain security, you're talking about, you know, the packages you depend on all day, every day, there's some, just a very t small minority of folks that are really like doing uh, a lion's share of the work to, to make sure that we have, you know, a secure uh, infrastructure and secure supply chain. So I see Jordan in the back there too. We'll bubble wrap you later. And for us, and there's a bunch of maintainers in here, like, let's hope there's not an asteroid that comes <laughs> crushing down here, so. Um, cool, so when we talk about this, this area, when we talk about uh, supply chain security, what are we talking about? Um, and, and why do we even care about, uh, you know, supply chain security? Um, well, it's really, open source has taken over. We used to have, uh, you know, 89% of the software we were shipping was closed source. And now we've totally shifted that to 89% of the, the software that you own in production is, is actually open source. And really securing the open source supply chain means we are, you know, you know we are securing our own products uh, supply chain as well. So it's critical to get this right uh, in the open source so that we can have safe uh, closed source software as well. And what are we talking about when we talk about supply chain? Well, we're talking about trust. So let's take a look at the current ecosystem, and this is going to help shape sort of like what I'm talking about, especially because uh, different, different sort of talks, I'm sure, can go into different parts of supply chain security. Um, specifically within JavaScript, there's a whole bunch of tools, and the landscape you know, has different players in it, different open source projects. There's the runtimes and engines, there's the package managers, the transpilers, and then a whole bunch of other packages as well. Um, and really, this is the layer that you see in NPM, right? Like the, the, all these categories of projects are the ones that are actually in the registry that we usually consider to be the ones that we actually can interface with and, and download and install. And, um, and today, I'm going to focus primarily on package managers because that's why I know. <laughs> no, no big surprise. But I'm going to talk about essentially why package managers are so important 
um, and uh, essentially what we can do to have more secure package management. Um, so of course, what does supply chain security look like in practice? Well, it's the dependencies you have, right? Um, and of course, JavaScript has a lot of dependencies. <laughs> it is the largest uh, software registry, NPM is the largest software registry in the world. Um, uh, we see over 3 million packages, I'm, I'm sure. Does everybody here have a package in NPM? Hopefully, most of you, some of you. Um, and of course, we see a ton of downloads, right? Like we see uh, 219 billion downloads a month. And of course, you've seen the memes, right? Like this is, this is the stuff that uh, gets a lot of likes on Twitter. People are sharing this concept that, you know, we are a very greedy ecosystem and obviously we, we just consume open source en masse. Um, I, and I actually look at these and I, I kind of, I'm sad because it, it seems like it's a failure that we don't really have good observability, right? Like I think a lot of people look at their node modules folder and they think that's a black box. And I think that's a bit of a failure on the tooling side of things. And, and I'll take a bit of responsibility for that. Um, of course, a like, large portion of those dependencies aren't actually things that you've included yourself. They aren't the direct dependencies. I know for us, you talk about this all the time in your talks, um, and it's actually being documented quite widely. The Octo GitHub Octoverse uh, report on this back in 2020. You, it's an average of 683 transitive dependencies in JavaScript projects today. That's crazy compared to the fact that there's only, uh, I think on average, it, it was like 10 direct dependencies, right, in the projects. So that's a, compared to all the other ecosystems, it just looks insane how many transitive dependencies we actually see. Actually see. <coughs> and if you don't know what a transitive dependency is, this little di diagram helps you. Um, if this is a new term for you, it's essentially something that you haven't included directly. It's coming into your project because it is a dependency of, uh, of a direct dependency or, or even uh, deeper in the graph. Of course, the fun stuff comes up with the fact that, or the, the kind of fun insights are that these types of dependencies are actually the ones that are uh, found to have the most vulnerabilities or be the you know, representative of uh, having the most vulnerabilities is sort of those deeply nested dependencies that you didn't even include yourself have, have the most vulnerabilities. So roughly 75% of vulns are living there. Um, and you would have seen, I think this stat was used in one of the keynotes as well. It's from Sonotype State of uh, Software Supply Chain from 2022. Um, so we've seen like an increase uh, of over 742% in uh, attacks on the supply chain or open source su supply chain. This is what this looks like on a graph. Graphs, yay. Um, <laughs> it's kind of scary when you think that um, attackers and people act that actually want to disrupt our ecosystem, not just sort of um, benign uh, vulnerabilities, th this is increasing, right? And the JavaScript ecosystem being the largest um, is sort of ripe for uh, disruption and, and it sort of has a lot of low hanging fruit in terms of the API surface area that we support. So I don't want to know what this looks like next year, but we'll, I'll see you next year and hopefully we're all still here. Um, <laughs> hopefully we're all still here. Um, everybody in this, this room probably will have a job next year. If you take this back to your companies, they're like, I know more about you know, security. Um, and you'll have a job for a long period of time, right? So this is great. Everybody here is gonna switch to be security experts. Um, in terms of GitHub, because I know this ecosystem well, I used to work at GitHub. Um, GitHub's own advisory database for the NPM ecosystem was like 2,900 advisories. A lot of those had actually been migrated from the NPM advisory database. Um, and roughly 80% of all Dependabot alerts are actually for the JavaScript ecosystem, which is kind of crazy. So we're talking about a lot of compute that uh, GitHub actually gives away for free with, this, uh, with that tool. Um, and actually there's roughly 8,000 malware takedowns that now are represented in the advisory database. It's kind of hard to find if you want, want to know how to actually see those, uh, let me know. And that doesn't actually represent all the malware takedowns. Uh, I know some companies and, and rep representatives here 
uh, know that that's the case, that not all malware takedowns are actually in advisories, which is unfortunate, but uh, this is a pretty large sample size of, of what we're dealing with. <coughs> so who feels like this is true, this stat is true? Feel free to raise your hand. Wow, okay, we got some, a lot of ICs in the room. Um, <laughs> it's true, you, you feel like it's, it, it's low. Um, this was the last uh, data point that I, I could find. It's actually a couple of years old, so you're probably right. It's, it's probably a lot lar larger than this, and you, you get a sense that it's becoming unmanageable, actually dealing with dependency updates and, and the fact that you're, you're getting hit with uh, an advisory. Um, it, feels, it feels overwhelming. Um, and I have some examples of this actually uh, down the line here, but yeah, so 59% chance in the next year you're gonna get an advisory. Um, I bet you in the next week you'll probably get <laughs> hit with something. So where are the actual threats when we're talking about supply chain security? I'll try to move quickly through these because many of these are known, that they get reiterated, rehashed. Um, you know, vulnerabilities are, are sort of the easy, easiest thing. Like I, I did not do something um, that exposes me to cross-site scripting attack or something like that. Um, malware is the, sort of the, the worst case scenario. People are actively trying to, to, to write software that um, is malicious. Typo squatting is, you know, fat fingering something and, and sort of getting socially engineered to download something that you didn't mean to. Um, dependency confusion is sort of a very unique um, type of attack that uh, is seen or, or an exploit that can be used um, where essentially the, the infrastructure that has been created for enterprise, uh, enterprises and corporations to proxy the NPM registry has created this sort of situation where um, you can potentially download and be socially engineered to download software you didn't mean to um, in your company. Uh, and then there's registry compromise. This is like very unlikely. Um, does anybody know if the NPM registry has ever be compromised? <laughs> that you know about? Um, no, no, and, I, and the funny thing here is that you, most of you all have essentially a cached version of most packages with integrity uh, uh, checks and, and can basically uh, tell whether or not a package might have been uh, modified in some weird way. Um, that's why lock files exist. This is why um, folks that are mirroring the registry can also, you know, if you're writing a registry follower, the NPM registry follower, um, then you can also sort of flag to the ecosystem. We would long hear that, you know, tarball has been compromised before I think it would ever reach your front door. And then the worst case scenario is account takeovers. So somebody like, I don't know, offers you a beer and then uh, starts uh, publishing packages <laughs> from your laptop um, or, you know, is able to do some sort of session spoofing or something like that. They're able to actually get your credentials published as if they were you. Um, how can we mitigate some of these? So GitHub and, and NPM have been trying to do a lot of work here. Uh, I can't speak to, you know, any initiatives in the last four months since I, I quit in December. Um, but there was definitely a, a focus on uh, doing more active scanning. I know a lot of companies in the ecosystem have been doing active registry scanning uh, for malware and helping to report it back to the uh, NPM registry. Um, there's also new sort of technologies in terms of uh, the uh, AI models and behaviors that they're seeing within the package contents. And the key here is like focusing on package contents for malware, right? It truly is like the source code doesn't matter as much as the actual thing you're about to download. Um, so focus on contents is, is key here. And of course, like surfacing this back to the canonical registries is important. Um, typo squatting, the ways we can mitigate that is, is definitely through heuristics, right? So known patterns or dark patterns to sort of socially engineer, you can imagine uh, pluralization or prefixing or suffixing package names is an easy way to essentially socially engineer packages that can be um, downloaded by accident. Um, and then so finding those patterns, creating sort of heuristics also based on potentially downloads or package authors, 
Um, having good uh, sort of heuristics around this can, can create tools that we can help prevent typo squatting attacks. Um, of course, policies and enforcement, uh, just how do you configure the tool that's uh, installing the thing to, to make sure it's not actually downloading a typo squatted tool. Um, in terms of how we mitigate dependency confusion attacks, it's really tough. Um, the key here is own a scope. That's, that's what we've told people for years. Um, own the public scope in the NPM registry if you're going to uh, have private packages that you're publishing to an Artifactory or Nexus instance. Um, you should always own the scope so that you don't get uh, exploited and, and always make sure uh, your NPM RC file has the config for, for that scope to be uh, proxied through. <coughs> in terms of registry compromise, we already have the tools to essentially uh, check this. If you're not using lock files for some reason, I don't, I'm sorry, like you're, <laughs> I don't know why you're doing that. Um, but that's the key here is we store that information about uh, packages uh, into tarballs, uh, or sorry, packages into lock files uh, about the target balls, and we do uh, integrity checks today that should prevent any kind of like registry compromised uh, asset. Um, and account takeovers, NPM did a ton of work here enforcing mandatory 2FA. A lot of folks are, are not happy about that, uh, but it does, you know, sort of raise the bar in terms of potential account takeovers. Um, also improved sort of login experience with, with uh, modern sort of web auth n. Um, Login uh, was implemented into the NPM CLI itself. So if you ever type NPM login as a V9 and beyond, we've defaulted to that you know, web auth uh, experience. So now you can get uh, thrown to the website, put in your credentials, or, or use a, uh, um, uh, yeah, like a web auth and experience in the browser to essentially log in or publish uh, when you're publishing as well to, to authenticate. So those are sort of the known um, sort of attack vectors. I'm sure you've even heard like many times over the, the five or six categories of, of exploits that uh, I talked about there just now. But there's a whole bunch of other areas that are, are sort of less talked about. Um, specifically, the noise within supply chain uh, tooling is, is a huge problem today. Um, there's a lot of confusion as well about um, you know, how dependency graphs should be represented. Um, there's some obfuscation around APIs as well. Um, and just generally, there's a real lack of, of tooling to help you deal with uh, advisories, to help you deal with updates. Um, and in terms of standardization, there's also a pretty huge lack of standardization around package management. And, and the very last one, actually, there's a ton of mutability when we're talking about installing software within JavaScript, and it's a huge problem. <coughs> I'm just going to take some water. So this, this area, uh, essentially mutability and, and non-determinism, it's, it's something that I'm not sure if a lot of folks in this room have dealt with, um, but it's likely that you've installed a package which has a lifecycle script, a post-install um, script that executes and modifies uh, files uh, on your system in some way, which is different than the artifact itself that, that they existed. Might even reach out to the network to, to fetch some, some something, and uh, it is inherently not the same thing that was published that is now uh, you know, living on your system. So I thought I would share a, a quick example of, of just sort of mutability and non-determinism within the ecosystem. Um, who's ever used Create React App? It's okay. It's okay if you're not a front-end developer. You can <laughs> um, and not to pick on Create React App, like great project. Um, this is after initialization of, a, of uh, I think I ran MPX, you know, uh, Create React App. Um, this is what your dependencies will look like in your package JSON. So you, you get seven direct dependencies added to your project when you're starting a new, a new React project. Um, and so you're like, okay, great, that's, that's, that's awesome. Um, so what happens if I decide to use one package manager or another? Well, to actually install those seven direct dependencies with Yarn, I actually get 1,200 
dependencies in my in my graph. So you go from you know seven direct dependencies now to inflated you know number of transitive dependencies to fully realize uh, the dependency tree there. Um, and also you see start to see this crazy pattern, which is none of these numbers are the same across all these package managers, right? So um, this is a huge problem. The representation of that project, that package JSON, to PMPM is different than Yarn. It's different to NPM. It's different to Bun and Deno, these new projects that are also doing sort of seamless, no install experiences. Um, and so there's a difference of almost 850 dependencies between these package managers. It's pretty, pretty insane, right? So this is where like the lack of standardization about how we resolve your dependencies is a huge problem and probably a bigger problem to supply chain security than folks might realize. So you're probably like, wait, what, Darcy? Like, what the heck is going on here, right? And I actually shared uh, this insight uh, on Twitter. Um, uh, and I'll, I'll show you the responses there in a second. Um, but, but what's actually going on here is that each package manager has a very different understanding and different capabilities about um, resolving you know, your, your, your project, your dependencies in package JSON. So it depends on whether or not they're going to install, like the context is key, but also their understanding of development dependencies, optional dependencies, peer depths, any overrides or resolution features that your package manager might have. You know, lifecycle scripts as well is gonna create some mutability and potentially change the number of dependencies installed. Um, so it, this, is, this is a lot of, uh, these are a lot of features that you know, each package manager can take a different stance on any one of these and create a different representation uh, than one or another. So any kind of like security tooling or anything that's using one representation may be false or invalidated if you decide to use a different package manager tool the next time you install your project. And so I said, I, I posted this on Twitter and some people are like, what the heck? Um, <laughs> I think uh, ZB was kind of like, okay, but are they fast? You know, so, like, it doesn't matter as long as Bun is like blazingly fast. It doesn't matter which packages I get on my system, right? Um, I know Wes is in this room. Okay. <laughs> but some of the people are in this room, so I'll let them take a picture. Um, so some of the responses were really funny, like to be like, oh, like what the heck is happening here? I think Jordan, I didn't put your response, but you know, he, he was digging into how I got that, this data. And it was a, a bit of manual work to actually get the, the out of the caches for Deno and Bun, I had to go into the caches to go get the, the, those results. But yeah, this is pretty interesting. I think Wes's comment specifically, so Wes sitting over there um, <laughs> is super interesting. You know, he's, he's saying, um, and, and I think very sarcastically, because you know the answer to this, right? Uh, but not everybody here might know. Um, well, what would happen if I ran that same package manager again on the same package JSON? What would happen? It would be, it would be pretty funny. Well, there's actually this like <laughs> statement. Um, and of course, when we, we talk about supply chain security, there's been a lot of talks about uh, reproducible build, probably hermetic environments, hermetic, uh, builds and they actually that comes back from this uh, Heraclitus of Eusephorus, I think the Greek uh, philosopher said like no man ever steps in the same river twice. Um, I like to say that no package JSON installs <laughs> the same river twice and that's a hipster from San Francisco um, specifically full stack um, probably using Vercel. Um, <laughs> But it, it's true, it's, a, it's an unfortunate fact that um, NPM install is, is not, it's not consistent, it's not reproducible. And, and part of it has to deal with time and it's very philosophical. Are you the same person you were uh, today that you were yesterday, you know? It, it's a bit philosophical, but also at the same time, there's real world problems with, uh, with the, these tools. So how can we avoid that, that worst case scenario that as you continue using the same tool, you're actually getting different uh, results over time. So uh, NPM install, if I use it twice in a row, like how do I ensure that it's the same thing always? So the key here is at, sp at least with your dependencies, you should be avoiding sort of mutable references. And so this isn't very well documented, but things like distribution tags, so that specifier or like at latest 
or at like a pre-release or something where there's a, a distribution tag that lives uh, within um, within the NPM registry, that's kind of, kind, of, kind of considered like a release channel. And that thing can update all the time, right? It's not a specific version that you're, you're sort of opting into. Um, same with remote tarball URLs. You can actually specify a package as if it's an uh, individual file. And that thing has no, uh, has no kind of uh, uh, registry integrity value that is being stored uh, back in the registry. So this thing can change over time. And same with Git repositories. Obviously, the references there aren't sort of locked in time. And in fact, we don't store back an integrity value at all for Git repositories. In specifically, we don't store back integrity, uh, sorry, value for uh, repos repository dependencies in your lock file. Um, so key here is uh, just be mindful that like these references are mutable. And uh, actually, this warning is that uh, not all the package metadata in the registry has been validated. Um, so how else can we sort of get rid of this mutability or avoid it? Um, use lock files, plain and simple. Um, understand what's in those lock files. So like know what those values are, what can and can't be checked for integrity, like I just said with, uh, with Git repositories. And then you can actually use time travel which is pretty cool. For any registry dependency that exists, you can actually lock in time uh, the manifests that you'll, you'll fetch and the versions that you'll fetch um, from the registry that you're configured to. So this is a feature that's in the NPM CLI and it essentially uh, creates uh, a way to have a subset of the versions available. This kind of gives you a way to sort of lock things in time um, unless the NPM uh, team has like removed that dependency for like malware or something like that. This should be a pretty foolproof way of, of making sure you sort of get almost a reproducible build. And of course, if you're a robot, just cache and bundle everything. <laughs> like basically, once you fetch it once, just hold on to it. Um, yeah, yeah, this, this is a little robot that's coming back from the future to tell us what we should be doing. And it's still running .NET in uh, 2030. So um, a quick, I only have about 10 minutes left, but I want to also quickly look at some of the current tooling um, and the state of that tooling, um, because I know that it's not super easy to understand what's going on. Um, and yeah, sometimes you can be afraid, you might be afraid to ask me how to do certain things. You might be afraid because of this. So here's a, another example, I'm, I'm again, using Create React App, again, no, no shade. But uh, you know, this is a fresh install of Create React App, and I already have six high security vulnerabilities. I, I generated this like today. So <laughs> anybody starting a project with the tool, unfortunately, they're starting off with some vulnerabilities already in the project, and, that, and that's unfortunate. But it's great, NPM has just shown me post-installation, and actually I, I ran audit again just to make sure I wasn't going crazy, but I ran audit on the, on the project and it, hey, it showed me that there were six uh, high security vulnerabilities and it told me how I can fix them, right? So it says, here we go, uh, run NPM audit fix force. So I'm like, sweet, I'm about to do that. Luke, what's gonna happen? Say it again. Okay, and we got 84 vulnerabilities. So this is really unfortunate, right? So we, we have this tool, it tells you that there's some problems. We say, you sh can go fix it running this command. <laughs> and then you end up with what? What's the factor? Does anybody, quick mass? What's the factor you go from? Oh yeah, we've got all kinds of new dependence, uh, new uh, problems, right? So. And, and what's even more uh, probably uh, furious for end users is we tell you to run NPM audit fix again, <laughs> right? And you're just hoping, it's like, go back. No, like I want the old set, right? <laughs> right? So um, this is really frustrating. We got, we got people constantly complaining about this. So, and this is the state as of today of, of this project and these tools. Uh. I like that everybody in here is laughing because uh, 
I know that you all, you all experience this, and it, it's actually it's sad. It's it's not it's not a good situation. Um, there's some companies really trying to do great work in this space, though. They're trying to innovate. Um, GitHub obviously has Stepenabot, uh, Mend has Renovate, Sockets, as Frost is in here, is, is trying to do great work in here, trying to obviously improve the state of uh, security, insights, these advisory tools. Um, but I, I do want to note some red herrings and, and sort of issues, obviously, red herrings in terms of the NPM audit tool, that's a great example. Oh my gosh, like I, I do this thing, I get another thing. Um, some of the advisory tools, obviously, like NPM audit is a good example, are, are giving false positives, uh, they're creating noise, um, and uh, you know we're doing all this work, we're creating all this noise in the guise of, well, a false negative would be worse, right? Like that's the, we, we want to tell you about everything, and even if we're wrong, uh, it's better than if we, you know, if you, we happen to not tell you about something, you know, like. Um, SPOMs is, I'm sure you've heard uh, the term, software bill of materials, you know, uh, are in the JS ecosystem. We've had lock files for a long uh, period of time. Just be mindful that uh, some of the standards um, don't map one-to-one -one with our, our ecosystem. I've been able to generate SBOMs from GitHub's new tool that don't actually match reality, which is unfortunate. So these are things that might, may or may not provide value to you, um, but you already today sort of have a ledger of the software that, uh, at least within the JavaScript uh, ecosystem for your project, you should have a ledger um, and, and an index of the, the packages that you have in your project. This is another one that's a bit um, concerning. There's a lot of work that goes and a lot of focus that has gone around um, sort of artifact signatures. Um, and it's like you really care about the package contents more than anything else. And I know that people care very dearly about uh, provenance, but uh, yeah, NPM did ship a feature here. If you want to validate the integrity of the signatures, you can do that with NPM audit now. Um, so there is a tool if you do care about these things. Um, I think the focus is a little bit misplaced. Um, in terms of scorecards, brands badging, this is something every org needs to, I think, weigh against the policies and, and sort of the, be concerned about the biases. Definitely have a zero trust mentality when it comes to security. Um, don't trust me, don't like validate everything I say. Don't trust like the big, big orgs. Definitely look into, uh, look into these things yourselves. Um, and just in general, like watch out for panaceas. Like there's a lot of companies that are telling you they fix all your problems. S bombs are going to save us. Um, <laughs> it's 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 not true. There's not one. There's not one like silver bullet here. There's a lot of different tools. A lot of different things we have to fix. <clears throat> so with the last few minutes that I have with you, uh, I want to talk about the future state and, and some solutions because. I, I know this has been a little bit dark. Um, don't worry, there is hope. Ah. So insights, I mentioned before, there's companies that are actually doing some great work in terms of um, bubbling up what's inside the contents of packages, um, creating great metadata that we can use. That's something we've been missing from uh, from basically the dependency graph today to be able to build great tooling around great data and insights about packages. Of course, we're also, I think as an ecosystem, we, we are really needing reproducible installations. And the only way we can get there is, is by removing our need, our, our sort of crux on the mutable server installation process with post install scripts. And so we definitely need first class what I've been pushing for is first class support for package distributions. It's an idea that um, has been around for a while. It's uh, something that there's been some uh, support for or, or pushes for with Yarn. Um, at NPM, I put together an RFC for, for, for this. Um, this is theoretical, again. This is just a spec that we've been putting together. But this would create a blessed way to have essentially per uh, environment or, or sort of per condition, um, sort of variants of packages. <coughs> uh, 
There's also been some great work in terms of, you know, runtime isolation um, with the uh, experimental permission uh, work that went into Node. I think, when did, do you know when it landed? Okay. So it's been around for a while, and then same with the experimental policy API, which Bradley, unfortunately, isn't here. Did a lot of great work there a while back. Um, and so we have these two great features within Node today that you can go try out and see what it looks like. This is very similar to what Deno has implemented with sort of uh, uh, policy enforcement of the runtime. NPM has an RFC open for permissions, and I would love to see you know, per package uh, permissions. Uh, I have a screenshot here of, uh, has anybody ever written a, uh, a web extension? Yeah, a couple? Web extensions in the web manifest uh, file actually has like permissions and scopes like baked into their web manifest format. And I would love to see us, you know, eventually adopt something like that to make it easy to sort of provision at the package level. And so that's what uh, I think we're trending towards and, and I hope we get to. Um, the last thing I wanted to sort of touch on, I don't know, I only have like one minute, I'm almost over, is sort of introspection. Last year, we uh, did something really cool. I put together this uh, spec for what is called like the dependency selector syntax. It's basically lifted CSS syntax that makes it super expressive to write queries against your dependency graph. Um, this is a set of examples of what that looks like. If you've ever written CSS, you're probably like, holy cow, like I know how to find all the React versions easily, you know? Um, you can also do really interesting things like finding your peer depths, whatever that is. The attribute selection is especially interesting um, because you can essentially query for any kind of attribute that lives on in your package JSON. So you can see how with more information into the dependency graph, we could actually do really cool queries. Um, and this landed, here's some more examples of exactly what you can do with this syntax. Um, but this landed back in NPM v816. So, and big, I was just, should say a big applause to Roy and, and Luke for work on the NPM CLI that got this done. So here, the very last example is a, a query for all the lifecycle scripts. Programmatic, you can actually use this today. Like if you want to go write some interesting queries, you can actually query it just like you would in the DOM, right? Like in the, you want to write some JavaScript to query your HTML documents, you can actually query your dependency graph with the query selector all, um, which is really cool. Um, and if you want to, you can use the command line npm query. So this takes your node modules folder and sort of says, let's stop letting this be a black box and uh, do some investigative work. Uh, knowable selectors, you can do some interesting things with Sember. We've created like some pseudo selectors that are really cool. Um, not yet implemented, but that were spec'd out are, are things for CVEs and CWE uh, selectors. Also, uh, RFC today is a query, uh, query support for NPM audits. So that crazy noise this, that you see today, which might not be relevant to you, uh, could uh, go away very quickly by filtering out uh, sort of the things that you need. Uh, and lastly, uh, with validation, or sorry, with the query selector, um, you can write really expressive policies, right? So imagine ESLint for, you know, enforcing installation uh, policies of your dependencies. So key, imagine a world where we eventually standardize, you know, package resolution, um, similar to the browsers did with HTML5. Imagine we can have an amazing query syntax that allows you to, um, you know, expressively write and, and, and traverse your fancy graph. You would not feel like you're in the dark, but actually like you could find the things you need. Um, and so I really truly think that that's the way forward. Um, obviously, this talk is a lot about the accuracy of our, our dependency graphs and, and uh, securing them. We definitely need more standards. Um, 
if you stay with a zero trust mindset, you're gonna be a lot safer than you were coming into this. Um, please share any discoveries that you find. Uh, if you're gonna use the package manager today, please use NPM, it's as far as I know, the most accurate. Um, but yeah, that's it, thank you. And I think I'm at time, so I don't know if we have time for Q&A, but uh, yeah, I can talk to you guys. Any, any immediate questions, I guess? We might have like five, 10 minutes. Not, not at this point. Okay. <laughs> Does Arborist have a race method for matches? Does Arborist have a method, for, you showed the query selector all, does it have a matches where you could give it an, a, yeah, go back, wait, no, no, uh, no, the Arborist API specifically. Like your C, or C tree query selector all, yep. I, I'd be interested if there was like a, you have a reference to a node in an Arborist tree can, that you could say, does this match my query selector? Does that API exist? Okay. Uh, if we standardize it, it can exist. Yeah, we can, we can definitely do that, so. Yeah, the hope, the hope uh, towards the end here with the talks of standardization is that over the next year, I would love to bring a, lo a lot of this uh, work and like tooling to the OpenJS and, and to standards. Yeah. Anything else? Any other questions? Yeah. Did you try to fix React after another time? Did I what? Did you try to run npm audit fix dash Again? dash for yes? Do you time? know the result? No, it, it's you, uh, you go back to the first one. Yeah. Yes. No, no. Um, <laughs> we it's actually intermittent. We actually I think there's potentially a race condition as well. Yeah. Yeah. So that's that's another issue. Truly, like no package install is the same twice, or no npm install is the same twice. Anything else? Cool. Thank you so much for coming. <laughs>